So hopefully you're all caffeinated and ready for another two exciting talks now. Um, we have two projects coming up which have uh, activities in the US and activities in Europe. So um, I'm Heidi Dempsey, I'm the research director from the US uh, and we do a lot of joint work obviously with uh, people in the research group here and people in universities in Europe uh, as well as Ilya who you'll see later who's our coordinator uh, for research in Tel Aviv. So um, wanted to make sure that this program was representative of our global interests. So this will give you a taste of that. If you're interested in anything else about the US, please come talk to me during any of the breaks or this evening. I'd like to introduce um, Abhamanyu Gosain. Um, he is the senior director of the Wireless Internet, Internet of Things uh, at Northeastern University. And he's also uh, an advisor and a chair on several important advisory committees for the FCC. Uh, he's been working in wireless networking for as long as I've known him, and I've known him since he was a graduate student. Uh, his first project was trying to deploy wireless networking on light poles in the Massachusetts environment, um, which is a very rugged out outdoor environment, and he was up to the challenge, and he's been uh, up to the challenge of ever larger and more complex uh, wireless network systems since then. So he will be speaking on Lego for 6G. Uh, so please welcome him to the stage. Just a quick comms check, yep. Thank you. Good. Okay, uh, good afternoon, and again, thank you for the kind words, uh, Heidi, and thanks for the invitation to the Red Hat team. Uh, it's been a fabulous event so far. So um, I'm gonna shift the focus a little bit to uh, talking about wireless communications, and I'm just gonna build a case as to why particularly this audience, Red Hat, and some of the, the products and services that are out there are, where we're getting to a point where these things are going to be intertwined very, very strongly. So we've done some early work on sort of uh, doing some proving joint case, but Early on, I just want to sort of level set. So thanks again, I'll just flash this, that's, uh, that's who I am. Um, but 5G, again, I, I, I don't mean to, uh, you know, presume or assume anything, so really quickly, it'll seem a little bit pedagogical, but I just want to get some terminology out of the way so we can be consistent. Um, with 5G, again, you're seeing this proliferation of devices in the market, and as uh, the generations of the Gs go, we're moving from 3G, 4G now into 5G, and essentially looking at large number of bits, looking looking at distributed computing, looking at edge networks, and all motivated by the use cases you see on, on your right. And again, you know, this is something that all of us sort of live and breathe each and every day. This is sort of a little bit more important, um, and I think this sort of connects uh, what's happening in the wireless domain and how this sort of connects into the compute and uh, distributed networking uh, paradigm. So there is this new paradigm uh, called open radio access networks, and essentially it's trying to disaggregate and break down uh, the uh, monopolized, fully vertical, end-to-end um, -end solutions that are sold by your tier one vendors today. And alongside that open radio access network, which is disaggregated, there's also a notion of introducing uh, cloud and uh, virtualization and softwareization, and these are all the words that we love. Uh, so with CRAN or CloudRAN, the idea is to take the functionality of uh, the radio access network functions on the base station, on the edge network, and then basically run it in a cloud native form. On the VRAN side, that's basically doing virtualization uh, paradigms and essentially breaking down the physical and the virtual network functions and essentially running them as much as you can on software and on commodity uh, servers. There's FPGAs for the radio part and uh, GPUs, FPGAs, and uh, CPUs on the, on the network part. So this is probably where I'm going to start to tie in what's happening on the radio world and sort of what uh, we're, we're seeing on the compute and uh, networking infrastructure side. This again motivates what I talked about earlier. In the 4G side, we have this traditional black box, monolithic systems running the enti entire network protocol stack, basically zero visibility into the network. So if you're an MNO, a mobile network operator, or an academic, or uh, a solutions provider, you basically didn't have any visibility. Now we're moving to this open programmable virtualized paradigm, and essentially we've disaggregated the radio access network into three elements. So again, you, know, you don't need to become an expert into this, but basically what you need to take away 
is that you have these three uh, disparate elements, the control unit, the distributed unit, and the radio unit. And in reverse order, real-time processing happens on the radio unit, and as you move towards the central and the distributed unit, you're looking at edge and uh, uh, central office kind of deployments. And these are all connected via standardized interfaces that are right now in varying stages of readiness. Uh, the open front hall interface is the one that we don't care about here, but the idea here is uh, that you're able to sort of stitch together different pieces, and hence sort of the title of the talk, Lego, which is essentially uh, taking different modular pieces and connecting them over standardized interfaces. This is a story that's played out in the cloud environment many, many years ago, and now this is sort of coming into the fore in the radio access network side. Um, this is a busy slide, but basically the main takeaway here that I want you to uh, um, get is there are a proliferation of open source, open access projects that are out there that we have sort of put together, um, and we in this case, meaning the community, and you'll see who uh, the partners that I'm representing here are, into what we like to call an end-to-end -end virtualized programmable 5G and beyond architecture. All of this uh, can be instantiated with, uh, in, a, in a turnkey fashion. Um, it's, it's all sort of cloud native, containerized, and how the architecture is set up, we'll, we'll talk about that. Some of these projects may be familiar to you, starting on the right side again from the radio access network, building all the way up to the edge, to the core, and then uh, wrapping a layer of service management orchestration, uh, SMO, and MANO uh, frameworks on top. And the idea being, the, the nice thing here is all of these are different projects, different code bases, but uh, the ability that we can containerize them uh, gives us an opportunity to sort of have this reference architecture, and um, we can always debate and discuss what would reference mean, um, and, and how do you sort of keep this architecture uh, going, and that's part of the systems level view that I'm going to give you very briefly, which is what we do operating test infrastructure for the U.S. research and industrial academic community. So this is a flagship program from the U.S. National Science Foundation and a, a membership consortium of about 35 companies, which was started in 2017 at the early outset when these uh, things were just words on a paper. And now we've sort of operationalized this in building large-scale wireless test beds uh, in four major cities in the United States. So this was about $100 million total, and this is primarily what uh, you know got me involved in this. So I'm the, I'm the technical director for this particular project. Uh, platform sort of advanced wireless research, and these are sort of the main uh, stakeholders. Um, companies, again, some logos need to be updated, but about 35 companies that are represented here, the entire telecom value chain, who've contributed equipment, resources, and dollars to build these large-scale test beds. Uh, the four cities here, again, you know, Powder Out in Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, Cosmos in uh, downtown New York, Air Powder Out in uh, North Carolina State University in Raleigh, and uh, the latest one in Ames, Iowa. Again, uh, this is not what the talk is focused on. The idea or the main takeaway here is there's test infrastructure, which is at scale, large scale, uh, which allows you to do actual real deployments, uh, proof of concepts, and testing. Uh, so these are not production networks by any mean, but these are all primarily uh, for research testing and uh, proof of concepts. The bottom one, Coliseum, which I'm going to talk about in some more detail, it's the world's largest RF emulator. It was a significant investment by the Defense Department, and then it was transitioned over uh, to uh, Northeastern University in 2019. And how that sort of fits into this uh, will be what I, I, I discuss primarily. These are kind of things that are being done on the power test bed. So again, you know, if you are a U.S. academic researcher or an academic in general, these are test beds that are available for you to use uh, today. These are all remotely accessible. Again, leveraging the the power of uh, compute, cloud, and distributed networking, uh, you're able to sort of deploy your experiments, uh, repeat them, reproduce them, and basically even try uh, new things. So these are the kinds of things that we are seeing uh, the U.S. academic research community try out uh, here. Uh, and the one that I, I bolded around acceleration, virtualization of network architectures is primary and key. Um, this sort of builds again on that big busy picture. I just wanted to distill that down into certain different components. The idea being that you can now take each of these uh, kind of self-contained um, uh, software stacks. So on the right side from user equipment or mobile network devices to the GNODE-B, which is just another fancy word for a base station, uh, to the edge and the core network and sort of interconnect them with standard interfaces to meet the kind of KPIs, metrics, or use cases that you may, uh, you may 
may want to uh, deploy. And how we deploy them, uh, how sort of OpenShift comes into play will be uh, sort of the primary uh, time I spend. Uh, Coliseum I sort of talked about briefly, just to give you an idea, it's sort of a micro data center, about 22 racks worth of equipment at Northeastern University, uh, 256 software defined radios, with, um, uh, so I, I get 256 because each of the radios has two ports, one transmit, one receive, and affiliated or associated one to one with 128 uh, x86 uh, kind of high performance compute servers, which have different kind of compute fabrics from GPUs, FPGAs, and uh, CPUs so different kind of processing modalities that are available to you. So it has uh, some significant skill that can be used. And, and the, key uh, the key feature here is those 256 radios are connected in a full mesh. So you can basically uh, emulate about 65,535 uh, real-time uh, radio channels, and all of this is done with hardware in the loop. So you actually have uh, analog signals going in over a coax cable when they're digitized, and basically we do some processing and what we like to call scenario which is basically representing a virtual world into the channel emulation system, layering on networking on top, and then traffic um, on, on top to do sort of large-scale emulation and experimentation. And again, remotely accessible, um, uh, you know, uh, asset, national asset here for the U.S. academic community as well as for a global uh, research community. And the idea is to do some testing on 5G, but also other waveforms, so be it Wi-Fi, be it some custom, um, you know, um, DOD or military waveforms or others that are sort of out there, so we're able to emulate all of them, leveraging the power of, you know, COTS equipment. Uh, that's the main architecture, and I think, again, um, uh, you know, the main takeaway here is that we have these things or these units that we call this SRNs, which is a standard radio node, effectively an x86 server hooked up to a USRP, and the ability to have a virtualization platform that sits on the, uh, on the hardware that allows you to run different kind of containers, uh, have basic isolation between them, and then essentially emulate the, the kind of scenario or architecture that, you want, uh, that you're trying to build. And on the right side is the management framework, which allows you to do this work fully remotely, resource management system, um, public gateways, multi, uh, you know, terabytes, uh, petabytes worth of storage, and, um, you know, kind of managed network services. So there's a whole team that sort of operates and runs this uh, infrastructure at Northeastern. And again, it's a test asset that, you know, if you're here in the audience that would like to use, come talk to me. So um, now shifting a little bit into the compute side, so the way we think of experimentation, and given that we have a heterogeneity of uh, test infrastructures from things that are sitting in the lab, so this is your basic uh, two computers, two radios sitting on a student's bench, all the way out to a Coliseum, which is a large-scale emulation system, out to a, maybe an indoor uh, or an outdoor large-scale deployment from the PAWR platforms that I talked about, the common denominator that we have been thinking, or the, 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 the test, uh, kind of an experiment as a service model that we've built is this using this uh, notion of a traveling container. So essentially a self-contained or a collection of self-contained containers that deploy uh, an experiment uh, is uh, approximated or emulated on the Coliseum infrastructure. Once you've done a proof of concept or a test validation and emulation, you can move that into the real world environment. Obviously, none of this is seamless. We, you know, there is some glue code or wrapping that has to be done to run on uh, the different variety of hardware that exists, but this is sort of something that's very, very easy, uh, straightforward, and we've been able to sort of do this. A uh, few papers that are cited here on, in the talks that I'd love for you to go and uh, reference. And then moving this out into testing large-scale capabilities in the test platforms that I uh, referenced earlier as the power platform. So the idea is that you can take this container, you can uh, do the progression of performance, you can do the progression of how your algorithms are performing in these different environments, and that's sort of the, the, the main takeaway here. So with this, so now sort of bringing back the radio access network and why we should care uh, about that is there is a paradigm and the, the two blocks that you see on your left side is uh, this notion of a radio intelligent controller. So maybe everybody in this room is familiar with what SDN and uh, software defined controllers were doing. That entire paradigm has now entered the radio domain where we're able to perform network intelligence at the radio level with very, very fine grain and very, very 
small time scale. So the notion of introducing machine learning models, AI concepts, and the ability to control all of that uh, with uh, abstract it away. So you, none of you need to be a radio expert. If you are, that's great. But you don't need to be that because now we have this uh, software-defined framework that industry has coalesced. Uh, and this is all coalesced under an alliance called the ORAN Alliance. Um, and that's what's defining all the specifications, the different common standardized interfaces that can be leveraged by anybody with, uh, with a computer to develop X apps uh, and R apps and basically leverage the power of these RICs. And RIC is a radio intelligent uh, controller. So the point of this slide is basically to emphasize the fact that you can place the intelligence based on whatever objective that you're trying to meet or trying to mitigate. So in case of you know, different things like jamming attacks or interference, you can actually deploy the intelligence at the distributed unit. So this is the near real time function um, which does most of the baseband processing, uh, which is basically converting IQ samples that uh, are gleaned from the radio unit and then uh, doing uh, some, uh, some work on the lower uh, Layer and uh, you know at the lower uh, at the higher network layers and you're able to sort of do that work. So this is just showing different kind of time scales um, and different network intelligence modalities that can be deployed on this infrastructure or on this paradigm of open radio access networks. Um, it's been done primarily to promote multi-vendor uh, uh, diversity and to introduce openness into the paradigm. So again, matches quite well to the philosophy that uh, people share in this room. And this is something that now uh, is being paid uh, a strong, significant attention by the global uh, academic research community and also helping bring more interdisciplinary research uh, with our AI ML engineers, computer scientists, and electrical electronic engineers sort of working together. Uh, this slide is sort of just showing the time scale. So this is, you know, you, if you're working at the higher layer management and control framework side, all the way down to the distributed unit or the real time radio in terms of doing inference or for actuation or automation or deploying AI ML using the different KPIs that you want to do. You have the ability to do it all the way from non real time. So about a second or so down to, uh, you know, close to real time, uh, tens of milliseconds or now a few uh, really pushing the envelope into sub milliseconds. So again, need lots and lots of processing, need lots and lots of uh, algorithms that can do this, need lots copious amounts of data to train the uh, uh, machine learning models that will help you uh, deploy this particular architecture. And this is what is being supported, as I mentioned, by the ORAN Alliance. And we're pretty active in uh, uh, helping that work go about. Um, so shifting again, so that same paradigm of uh, radio intelligent controller. So the main key building blocks we're going to talk about are going to be the radio intelligent controller and then the central unit, which is basically think of it as networking layer and higher up. So all the way up from networking layer up to PDCP layer. Then you think of the, uh, the, the interface between the networking layer and the MAC layer being deployed in the distributed unit and the radio unit is where all the analog real time processing is going to happen. So the open RAN gym is a framework we've introduced, which is an open source toolbox for X app development. So not too different from uh, what you guys were doing uh, or those who were working with SDN controllers and writing your own uh, uh, kind of algorithms. So you have the ability to basically do um, a, you know, a multi-step process. So this is sort of the experimental framework, which is starting from data collection. So you have to sort of build AI ML models so that your apps can actually have some intelligence built into them. So you have to have the training phase of it. So we enable uh, uh, real-time data collection on the test beds that we've talked about because these are essentially nothing more than data factories at this point. We allow you to build your AI ML models and there is again a framework for uh, designing, doing your model training and testing and then you can deploy that stuff on the radio intelligent controller as, um, as an X app and then you have the ability to do this work at runtime. We're able to glean how that algorithm or X app is performing, how the interfaces are reporting the data uh, back and this is all as I said done across the CU, DU, RU over standardized uh, interfaces and again I'm not going to bore you with those details. The idea here is to give you a framework that we've been able to leverage uh, and use and you know, can, uh, can use help basically going forward. Lots of interesting research problems to solve here. 
some of the components I sort of went through there, but just to see in a, in a pictorial format. So these are your uh, radio access network stacks. So these are, again, fully contained, uh, full stack softwareized uh, RANs that run on uh, COTS hardware. Um, a scope I'm going to talk about, this is basically our framework for data collection and control. So how can you uh, have a network objective or an intent, and how do you actually translate that into real runtime intelligence uh, to control what's happening in the network. Uh, the idea that we have basically full programmability end-to-end, -end, both vertical and horizontal, and the idea of using this uh, deployed over publicly accessible experimental uh, platforms. Uh, the XAP structure, again, for those interested, I'm just going to flash this here, um, doing basically AIML work, so the idea of being able to do data collection, uh, do inference, do prediction, do a full closed-loop control um, um, system, and you have basically, you know, uh, well-defined APIs that allow you to do all of these queries actuation. So again, you don't need to understand anything um, uh, on, um, you know, about basically electronics, electrical, um, RF, uh, or any of that work. You basically are just able to query information out of the, the interfaces and the different connections uh, that are available to you. Uh, so this is sort of um, now just getting down to brass stacks on what we've actually deployed uh, using um, OpenShift. Uh, high level, what's the problem here? So if you are a mobile network operator today and you suddenly have to deal with a situation where you need to stream 4K video to about 100 users, let's say, in Times Square at a particular time frame, you have to define the intent. And the network has to be able to recognize that intent. Then there has to be an automated way to orchestrate. And then you have the idea of zero touch reconfiguration. So the idea that this AI ML model that you've trained is able to glean and uh, get information in real or near real time and do some of the inference and modify the parameters as required, so the adaptation phase. So this is sort of the main high-level objective that we're trying to uh, 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 conduct. And uh, for that, we have this framework that we said, which is scope, which is essentially just deploying the entire network. So again, fully instantiating it on uh, the hardware, um, the, the COTS hardware that I sort of discussed and talked about earlier, the ability to have all of these, um, you know, the data collection. So all of this, uh, these softwareized stacks are parameterized. So the idea that you can collect IQ samples, network traces, packet traces, and basically report that back to your algorithm that's going to be deployed on the radio intelligent controller is something that's quite important. And then we have this prototype that allows you to implement custom control logic at scale. So um, walking down through from a network operator perspective down to the network deployment, you need to parse through what does that intent mean from 100 users in a particular geography, and then how are you going to actually do that particular broadcasting? Which of those AI ML models are you going to uh, use to satisfy the, the intent? Uh, basically digging into your M uh, AI ML models that you've built, so your catalog, deploying it, where are you going to deploy it? Now that the radio access network is fully disaggregated, you have the ability to go in, uh, in, in the central office, on the central unit, at the edge, at the distributed unit, or at, um, at the radio unit where you'll have the highest kind of fidelity, but also the highest uh, processing uh, work that you're going to need to do. So these are, th this is sort of what the, the you know, uh, orchestran, which is something that, you know, we've come up with, which is orchestrating intelligence in the open radio access network piece is going to be. And uh, what we're going to, you know, what I want to show you are just some very, very preliminary results. Um, this is sort of a paper that's right now, uh, you know, under review right now, so I don't have any of the, the performance data, but I have that stuff offline if you're interested to learn how we were able to sort of do this on, on OpenShift. But, this is what we did. So the idea was to submit the request, uh, collect them, do the computation of the orchestration policy, choose the model, and then deploy uh, the intelligence of the radio intelligent controller and uh, the CUDURU uh, paradigm. And we did this all on OpenShift. So uh, with OpenShift, we obviously, you know, some of the benefits that we see, and we see the strong intersection uh, between uh, using something that's enterprise level, well supported, and gives us a platform as a service, which which allows us to sort of build uh, the different pods and also uh, leverage some of the tools around CI, CD uh, and the different pipelines that are available. So uh, with this, we were able to sort of instantiate all different components, as you see, the RAN, the Edge, and the management network orchestration 
uh, function. This was all deployed as pods on uh, the OpenShift platform. Uh, this is sort of our uh, uh, piece of equipment that's co-located with the Colosseum infrastructure I referenced earlier. So this is where our entire OpenShift cluster runs. Um, the idea is we've been able to sort of orchestrate these RAN functions on demand. So these base stations, able to place them near where they're required, um, orchestrate the intelligence, so deploy our radio intelligent controller at the edge and then deploy the X apps on top of that radio intelligent controller and then basically redeploy and adjust uh, the allocations of these different network functions as, uh, as needed. Um, and this is sort of at a high level, you know, um, what, what we've sort of done or what this is right now a proof of concept but it's going to be scaled up. Um, so we've done something in the order of 50 or 60 users, uh, deployed um, all the different elements on, uh, um, on, on the OpenShift uh, compute platform, cloud platform and basically signal that, that work. So what's happening here and which is what we're also seeing uh, happen in the, in the network operator domain main is this notion of a neutral host. So some of this work is happening on-prem, uh, on equipment controlled by the network operators, but we're also seeing some of these deployments out there of the radio and the edge clusters happen by, uh, or, uh, by neutral third parties. And the idea is that you have uh, the ability, or uh, if you're a tenant, you're able to uh, basically forget about um, whether you control the infrastructure or not. You're able to submit your intent, and using this orchestra and overarching framework, you're able to convert that intent and communicate down to uh, the edge data center with the near real time rig. Um, this has all been deployed on uh, the uh, on Coliseum, and then we've moved it over to Arena, which is a large scale indoor test bed. So these are real radios, so, uh, kind of on the left side you see mounted uh, uh, downwards in a room that's about this size at uh, on campus at Northeastern University. About 32 radios, 64 servers, and uh, we've been able to sort of perform um, some of these inference, um, you know, technologies on on real real actual. Aspect. So I see him uh, at the at the end of my time, but again, main main takeaways. 5G beyond 5G, 6G paradigm, basically it's a key technology, uh, disaggregated radio access networks, openness for the first time is being talked about, being standardized, being specified, and the convergence of uh, large scale compute, uh, network orchestration, and disaggregated radio access networks is what you know, we're gonna have to work towards. So all of these different elements need to be stitched together, and again, this is sort of a call of action to you know, folks in the room that let's collaborate and let's uh, try to solve these problems for our, um, you know, for the future. So thank you again for your time and attention. Uh, I'm here the uh, rest of the day. Happy to take questions. Um, and again, thanks for the opportunity today. Thank you. Thanks, Manu. Yep. Uh, so we have several questions. Great. <laughs> um, let me ask uh, first, uh, and if you submitted this question and uh, you want to expand on it, feel free to speak up. Uh, there was a question on whether submitting, uh, splitting the technology between the black box and the connected components has an impact on government regulation. So. That's, Not so much in the test bed, but in follow-up. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's 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 a that's a great question. So right now, I think we're seeing a bifurcation where black box. Uh, there's there's a lot of and again, you know, this is. Um, Technology is always the least of the problem. It's more of the policies and politics. So U.S. government primarily uh, through a recent, and again, whoever follows U.S. politics has uh, passed a new uh, very large scale bill called the CHIPS Act. Within that CHIPS Act buried is this language around um, deployment of open radio access networks in the large scale uh, deployments that are gonna happen in the future. Uh, now that's not, never going to happen in a greenfield environment because these networks have legacy see, and I guess that's probably was the tone of your question, which is there are these black boxes out there, how are we going to work? So the, the idea is that these standardized interfaces that are being uh, discussed and debated in the ORAN alliance actually have all of those tier one vendors that are, uh, that are in there. So they're happy now, just again, speaking you know, very candidly, to open up functionality at the network layer and up. 
but they're not going to let you go down into what we were calling the distributed unit. So there is this notion of a D app, which we have floated, um, and that's going to do near real-time control, and that's going to allow basically the interoperability, if that's what you were alluding to, between legacy black box networks and these new disaggregated, uh, you know, RAN intelligent paradigms. But still, work in progress. Again, no, 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 uh, no crystal ball. Okay. Um, another question uh, having to do with the real-time constraints. So you mentioned a little bit about you, how, how you control those, yeah. um, but it's hard to see from the high-level uh, diagrams. Can you say a little bit more about how you uh, fulfill those in a, an environment where you're setting real-time constraints? Yeah, so real-time is still a concept that you know, this, this is an academic exercise, right? So the, the only thing that people are talking about is about 10 milliseconds to 20 milliseconds. That's near real time. That's the only paradigm that they're doing. What we've tried to push is this notion of doing something that's going to be at the sub uh, millisecond, uh, w uh, you know, latency. And, and the way we just sort of deal with it is just through a large amounts of data collection and making our models uh, better and better. And then this will also have, uh, you know, uh, for those of you who are experts around placement of network functions, it's going to go into, you know, where can the edge network function be placed? We want it to go down into the distributed unit, which is what uh, scares some of the black box tier one vendors because they don't want to open that functionality up. Um, and that's sort of, again, from, you know, an academic and a cohort of people who've gotten together trying to push that functionality. But unless, uh, you know, network equipment, equipment vendors play f uh, ball with us, and I'll just harken back to how this sort of came out uh, in the early days of OpenFlow SDN when we didn't have visibility into some of the major tier one vendor switches and look where we are now. Yeah. So that's sort of how I see this playing out. Uh, okay, and uh, one more question. How do you visualize the aggregated radio signals on a map in the testbed? Yes, so uh, we, we, have, we have a bunch of virtualization tools that, that we've come up with. Again, we can do better. Um, so on the, uh, uh, th there are some tools, and I, uh, maybe I just sort of ran over that details uh, too quickly. So I'd happy to sort of show you what, what we have in terms of you know, an RF heat index, uh, in terms of link quality signals. So we're able to sort of overlay, overlay that into the scenarios that we create. And I didn't uh, show you a scenario, but again, think of like a room like this, where we first go and do some data collection, we uh, do some real-time real, uh, real -time ray tracing and basically build a model of the room, the reflections, the absorptions, and then uh, model that into the Coliseum infrastructure, and then we can layer on uh, the auto propagation. So we have tools, some that we've built, some that we've partnered with companies, and again, happy to give you a little uh, peek over the shoulder. Yeah, they're really interesting. To Great. Look at. Yeah. Um, so these were very dense complex slides. Um, they will be available on the research website, uh, research.redhat.com, after the event, along with the recorded videos. If you want a copy right away, be sure to talk to sure. him while he's here, um, or on the internet afterwards, reach out. So thanks again, Manu. Thank you. Thanks again.